Hi, um, I'm Richard Sever from Cold Spring Harbor and BioArchive. With me, I have Andrew Dillon from UC Berkeley. Andy, welcome to Cold Spring Harbor. Welcome to the symposium. Thanks, Richard. Um, it's, it's great to see you back here. I kind of feel like I'm in my comfort zone because normally when we meet up, it's in some sort of death-defying ski slope. Um, I feel a little bit more comfortable here, but on the other hand, I'm out of my depth academically. So let's talk about mitochondria. Oh, I don't think you're out of your depth at all, <laughs> at all. You're an avid skier and you know more about mitochondria than you think. Well, well let's see. <laughs> um, so you're going to be talking later in the meeting about mitochondria um, and their role in aging. Um, I was looking at your abstract and it, it was fascinating. You, you start talking about the concept of um, mitochondrial stress and how this is signaled um, to the rest of the body. So can you just start by talking about this, this the, the mitochondrial UPR and this concept of mitochondrial stress and why it's important. Yeah, so it's, that's a really great question. And I think when we think about mitochondria, we have to go back and think about where they actually came from. And they were actually primordial bacteria. Mm -hmm. And they were autonomous, uh, they were autonomous systems that were there dealing with their own stress and dealing with it internally. And sometimes they would actually communicate it to their friends and their family. Mm -hmm. and, actually communicated to things they didn't like, other microbes didn't like. Um, but then when a mitochondria became, when a bacteria became a, a, a mitochondria, when we made the eukaryotes, you know, it sort of had to give up everything to the nucleus, all mm -hmm. of its control, but did it really? You know, it right. held on to a few things there. And when it gets stressed, now it doesn't know who to communicate with. Right. But it, it retained this ability to communicate and now it talks to the, to the nucleus and it's like, hey, I'm stressed, do something about this. And because it gave up all of its genes, most of its genes, 99% of its genes to the nuclear genome, then the nucleus sort of goes through and programs like, okay, I need to turn on these mitochondrial genes to go back and help that primordial uh -huh. bacteria, which is now your mitochondria. And the mitochondrial UPR, unfolded protein response, it's a misnomer. It's not really an unfolded protein response. It's more of a mitochondrial stress response. Right. And it's more about um, the mitochondria being stressed, telling the nucleus they're stressed, and make the products to come back and like relieve whatever stress is actually happening. So what do, what, when you say, what do we mean if it's not unfolded proteins? What is the stress that it's under? That's a great question. Um, so if you think about going back to mitochondria being primordial bacteria, you know, they had the, all these thousands of functions they were doing, right? So they're doing, making energy, they're also making lipids, they're trying to do all these different things. And a mitochondria does the same things. Mm -hmm. And so any stress of that system seems to trigger this. So membrane stress will do it, unfolded proteins will do it, you know, the ability to import proteins into the mitochondria will do it. If they can't replicate, so this is like when the Tim Tom complex type of thing. You're getting very technical. Right. See, you know more about <laughs> mitochondria than you're letting on to. Yes, when they can't import in or they can't replicate their own DNA, uh -huh. that will stress them out. And so, you know, normally they would be able to deal with this if they had their own genome, but they gave that genome up to the nucleus. Right. So they have to give signals back to the nucleus and say, "Hey, I'm I'm hurting here. Uh -huh. Help me out. Help me out." Yeah. And, and one of the things that you talk about is um, when there's change in stoichiometry of the respiratory complexes. I mean, wh when does that happen what, and what does it mean? You, that is a very um, artificial, so we discovered that if you cause, so the electron transport chain, the thing that really makes the energy of, of your cells, you know, it's these five complexes and they're, most of them are enormous. They're, mm -hmm. 40 subunits, you know, at, at times. Most of those are coming from the nucleus. A few of them are coming from the mitochondria. They have to meet up and do the right stoichiometry to be the right thing. And what we found is that if we cause that stoichiometric imbalance, that whole big thing falls apart. Uh -huh. And that's when the mitochondria is like, there's something wrong. We right. have to fix this. So it signals to the nucleus to come back and refold those proteins and actually make that complex so you can actually make energy again. So do you get that in, I mean, with mitochondrial diseases where you have heteroplasmy, is, is that going on the whole time then? So that is that is a crossroads where, you know, our research has been very fundamental and basic in C. elegans and tissue culture cells. Um, and it's really suggesting that if you can get this response going, it's very beneficial. 
And if you move it into the human population where there's mitochondrial disease or heteroplasmy mm -hmm. that you're talking about, um, there are instances where the factors that we find, similar factors are also being excreted and turned oh. on to try to get the mitochondria functioning again. Right. The problem is, it, it's a great system if the response can come back and fix that challenge, if it's fixable. Mm -hmm. But if the damage is too great, you turn on the response, but you can't fix it. Mm -hmm. And so in a lot of these patients, and a lot of these um, instances where there is mitochondrial challenge in human cells, you're turning on the response, but you can't fix it. Right. And so it's a signature right now. Like, okay, we know that there's a mitochondrial challenge. And so Anu uh, Sumalini and Bartavara has done some beautiful work showing that these same signals are what we're seeing in C. elegans are showing right. up in, you know, in human populations. Oh, oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, I mean, that, that we're, given that we're multicellular <coughs> organisms, it kind of raises the question of there's, I mean, there's, I guess there's two, looks like you're looking at two different signals. There's a signal from the mitochondrion to the nucleus saying, hey, I'm in trouble. Right. And you're kind of pulling apart the molecular details of that. And then there's a organism wide signal which is like hey this cell has a problem with the mitochondria and this is a symptom of something else so it's that first part what is the what are the molecules involved yes so that's another great question is that when we go back to the endosymbiosis is that when the bacteria got engulfed and made the mitochondria we were individual cells at that time and you only had to be able to communicate within that individual cell if you had mm -hmm. a mitochondrial challenge and then when you move it into a metazoan or a multicellular animal is every cell going to monitor its mitochondria and communicate mm -hmm. to itself, or is there gonna be sentinel cells that are monitoring mitochondrial challenges in the environment? Uh -huh. And you can think about a lot of those. You know, we come across mitochondrial toxins all the time in our world. You know, there's pesticides, there's other things that we're experiencing that are, of course, artificial, but growing up, you know, an organism growing up in the milieu of all the different things in the world, there's a lot of mitochondrial challenges that are hitting them. And so when you move away from trying to control the quality of your mitochondria in one single cell and letting, now you have a billion cell organism, mm -hmm. do you let every single cell do this on its own? Or do you actually put control over it? Right. And if you had every single cell do it on its own, it'd be completely stochastic. Yeah. It's like, would one cell respond, but not another cell because it hadn't had the toxin yet? Mm -hmm. And so why not put some control over that? And so that's, you know, our central nervous system, that's exactly what it evolved to do, is perceive the environment and actually communicate it to the periphery so that you make homeostasis. Right. So you're warned, you're adaptive to whatever is gonna happen to you. And it was striking that we discovered that when we just perturbed mitochondria just in the nervous system, it was sufficient to not only turn that response in those neurons and protect them, but then those neurons took that information and now communicated it to the periphery. Right. And so now we're recapitulating what happened to the primordial bacteria is that it's sitting there growing with all these bacterial friends, and when it feels stressed, it can talk to them. Mm -hmm. But now it's locked into a single cell. Right. And how is it gonna talk to all of its friends? Yeah. So it says to the nucleus, like, I'm stressed, but I'm a neuron. Let's tell everyone else about this. Right. And when it tells everyone else about all the stress, then those cells are now prepared for it. Even though they haven't felt the stress yet, they're prepared for the stresses that are gonna happen. Right, and, and so the biochemist in me wants to know, okay, so what are the molecules then? The stress response goes on in a mitochondrion. It's gotta communicate this somehow beyond the um, mitochondrial membranes, then something else is gonna happen. When I kind of like yes. write the list of molecules, what are they? Yes, so we're, so a lot of that is work from Cole Haynes and David Ron. They've figured out a lot of the circuitry of what's downstream. What are the transcription factors? What are the molecules that are actually there to set this program up? But when a mitochondria is stressed and communicates those transcription factors, we don't know. Right, okay. I mean, flat out, our lab is actively trying to figure this out and we don't know what it is. We have some hints, there's small molecules and things, metabolites th that maybe go wrong, but we don't know what they so are. So that would be the best guess, that it's metabolites that are coming through some- More than likely, of, more than likely coming out of the mitochondria is some metabolite imbalance 
something unique that's coming out. It could also be a peptide, but we don't know what it is. Right. Okay. So, the, so coming from the mitochondria to the nucleus, we know a lot about the nucleus that receives the signal, mm -hmm. but we know nothing about the signal. Right. But you know what happens downstream, the mitochine signal. Yes. Right. So if you're in a neuron and you have the stress of the mitochondria and it turns on this stuff in the nucleus, that neuron is going to make a packet of goodies to send to the periphery. Mm -hmm. And one of those goodies is a Wnt ligand uh, that signals to the periphery to turn on the same mitochondrial stress response. Right. So it interacts with the in in canonical normal Wnt signaling to turn on this whole response uniquely. It doesn't turn on the developmental program that Wnt normally challenges. It turns it on and it actually protects those animals. So if you have animals that can turn on this response on the neurons and communicate it, they're protected from the mitochondrial stress. Uh -huh. But if you have animals that we've blocked the ability of them to communicate, they have the mitochondrial stress on the neurons, they're like, I'm stressed, tell everyone else. They just do not turn on that response whatsoever. And they're not protected. Right. And so the, the other thing that was kind of interesting um, in your work is the germ cells come into it. So what's, the, the, I mean, you talk, the, everything you said makes sense. It and, makes perfect sense. And then now you say germ cells are an intermediate in this signaling. Yeah, loop. that's that's actually a perfect segue. I mean, yeah, hats off to you. You know much more than you're leading on to. <laughs> um, so when the signal comes out of the neurons, this went ligand, it interacts with all the cells and turns this response on. And Wnt is normally there to regulate development. That's its mm -hmm. normal function in every organism. It's regulating development or similar types of functions. And oddly, when we turn on this response, we don't see that developmental program turned on. We only see this, this mitochondrial UPR turned on. So we're mm -hmm. missing something. And in Koning Shin, who was a postdoc in the lab, she uncovered this really remarkable discovery that there was a mitochondrial protein that's only in the germ line that's required for this response. So if she knocks it out, the animals can make as much Wnt ligand, they're signaling to the periphery as much as they can, but they can't turn it on because there's something wrong with the germ line. So, so it's a nuclear gene then? It's a nuclear gene. Because that's the only way you could have yeah. it, right? It's a, it's a nuclear gene that's affecting the mitochondria only in the germ only line. In the germ line. And so then she does this a beautiful experiment that we've missed, we've missed it for 20 years, is she simply just took animals and removed their germline. Mm -hmm. And now you can do all the experiments we did where you turn this on in the neurons, they signal to the periphery, but now if they don't have a germline, they can't turn the signal on. Can't do this. So there's something coming from the germline, and we think it's, in the, so this makes sort of perfect sense to bring it back like this is a bizarre finding. But your neurons are probably the most sensitive cells to mitochondrial stress. So if they sense something in the environment, they're like, we feel the stress, let's prepare everyone. Right. But you couple that now with the germline. And you're like, why would you do this with the germline? And the germline, if you think about it, when all the mitochondria in you and I came from our mothers. Yeah. Right? Our dad put in like one or two and they got spit out and right. immediately among fertilization. So all of our mitochondria came from mom. And all the mitochondria that your mom had that put into that oocyte to make that embryo were the best mitochondria that were possible. So it started out with 40,000 mitochondria. Uh -huh. And then by the time that oocyte got made, there was only 40. Right. So the selection, you know, you think getting into Harvard's hard. Right. Being a <laughs> mitochondria that gets into an oocyte is probably even harder, right? So this is like the most pristine environment of mitochondria that possibly ever is. And so why not signal that I have a germline that has really good mitochondria and your neurons like, I'm stressed mitochondria, let's coordinate ourselves to right. ensure that I can actually be pregnant. Right, okay, wow. And so where does, where does aging come into this then? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, all the work started on aging, um, if we go back, all the work started on aging, and the paradoxical thing was when we started, Cynthia Kenyon and Gary Rufkin had discovered, you know, single genes that had increased lifespan when mutated, the insulin IGF-1 pathway. 
And I joined Cynthia's lab, and she was heavily working on insulin IGF-1. I knew that it, I had to find something different. I was like, well, maybe there's other pathways. Uh -huh. And Cynthia was like, you know, that'd be pretty cool if you found those. So she fully supported my work. And so I went through and I inactivated every single gene in the genome to see which ones would make animals live long. So I did, you know, 20,000 lifespans, horrendous amount of work. And of course I found Cynthia's genes, yeah. right? But then every other thing I found was reduction of mitochondrial function, everything I told wow. you about. So, re so reducing mitochondrial function turns on this response and it's protective and it's pro-survival. And so that made these animals live long. And that's how we got into it that, oh, this is really cool. But then we moved away from aging and it got more into the basics of what is this response? Yeah. Is it really about aging? Probably not, no. Yeah. It's going back to our primordial bacteria communicating yeah. to the neurons. So now we go full circle and it's like, okay, now we have bacteria, well, now we have neurons communicating to the periphery to tell them that they're stressed. And it's like, well, what are they perceiving? What is the bacterial, what is the mitochondrial stress? And if you look at, in our environment, most of the you know, poisons and things that we come across are produced by bacteria, toxic bacteria. Mm -hmm. And one of the most risky things we do every single day is eat. Right. Because there's gonna be a contaminant, right? Yeah. And so, wouldn't it be great if you could actually determine that before you actually ate it? Right. Pick it up in some way or another. And so what we've discovered now is that going back from our work where the neurons sense this and set it all up and tell the periphery it's happening is what are they sensing? And it turns out if you expose animals to just the smell of a pathogenic bacteria, now they turn on all this response. Wow. So they're setting yourself. And the more important thing is that not only is that animal protected, like once they smell the pathogen, and it's only pathogenic bacteria that do mm -hmm. it, uh, non-pathogenic don't do it, is that now they actually communicate that to the germline, mm -hmm. to where those mitochondria are pristine. So now if they smell it, they themselves are protected, but now their next progeny are protected as well. Wow, wow. So being in your environment and being around smells is actually pretty important. <laughs> right. <laughs> right, I mean there's a reason they, you know, our sense of smell wasn't there to pick up perfumes and beautiful French wines. It's there to actually protect us. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, I mean, it's amazing that you sort of, how many, well, I mean, I guess it's also predictable how many kind of like evolutionary yes. stories underpin all these things. And then they, when you look at it, you're like, well, that's why. Well, that's the way I view the world. Right. <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, that's the way that I've interpreted. Most people look at this data and they maybe they interpret it some other way. But I look at it, it's like you had to, there's a reason this thing evolved. Right. And it's like, right. what the hell in the environment is it smelling? And what better way to protect yourself than from a pathogenic bacteria that wants to attack your primordial bacteria, which is your mitochondria. Yeah. And then just like, oh, I, I'm ahead of you. I'm right. gonna send these signals out and protect us. Yeah. So now what's actually really cool is we're actually beginning to find bacteria. So there's this arms race that's going on. Mm -hmm. Well, so that was what I was going to ask. You said it's pathogenic bacteria, but not non-pathogenic. Non -pathogenic. It's like, yeah, it's, an, you, arms race it's an arms race. So now we're finding pathogenic bacteria that can actually turn this response off. Right. So they're like, ha ha, you may smell me, but I'm going to turn the response off. So, right. I, so now I can be pathogenic. Yeah. So it's really fascinating to see what's going to happen here, like how this is going to play out. Well, it's a fascinating story, and it's really interesting hearing about it. Thank no, you very thanks. much for chatting with us today. Well, thanks Indeed. for all the great questions, yeah. and hope to see you on slopes. Yeah. <laughs> Good to see you. <laughs>